Good evening. Welcome to the Wednesday ICA webinar. ICA, all, as all of you know, stands for Indian College of Anesthesiologists, which is highly academic in its nature and is imparting uh, the educational material and providing opportunities for all of us to upgrade ourselves in the field of anesthesia. It's an absolute delight for me to welcome you to this webinar entitled Hemodynamics what, when, and how. We have stalwarts in the field to discuss with us about the subject. And uh, I request all of you to put your questions and comments in the chat box, such that we'll discuss and answer the questions at the end of the session. Please stay tuned. And with these uh, words, I would like to introduce the <clears throat> moderators and panelists for this evening. First one is uh, Dr. Nivedita Pani. Dr. Nivedita Pani, who is professor in Orissa. She is the professor in HOD of critical care and anesthesiology at SCB Medical College, Qatar. And uh, she's uh, a very accomplished uh, individual with a lot of uh, credentials to her um, uh, credit. Next moderator will be Dr. Bhupesh. Dr. Bhupesh is a professor and HOD of cardiac anesthesia at the famous PGI Chandigarh. And again, he is a very accomplished personality. We have a lot to learn from him. Next is Dr. Vidya Patil, who is the professor and HOD Department of Anesthesiology at BLDE Medical College, Vijayapura in Karnataka. Again, a very pleasant and uh, highly acclaimed personality. And uh, last but not the least, we have Dr. Vivek Dave who is uh, into critical care medicine at the Narayana Health Ahmedabad unit. And again, a very enthusiastic and academic personality. And with these words, I would like to hand over the podium to Dr. Nivedita Pani to conduct the meeting. Please stay tuned till the end because we have interesting questions and discussions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mulija. Uh, welcome to the hemodynamic monitoring and what and when and how session. And uh, today's uh, is the topic is the basic hemodynamic monitoring. And the speaker is Dr. Bizas Benugapal. He is the professor and head HOD anesthesiology, Came City Medical College, Calicut, Kerala. He is a ISA Kerala GC member and webinar coordinator for the bi-weekly ISA Kerala PG update, number of publication international four and national 10, and guest lecture he has delivered 30, and he has got special interest in the quality control, cardiac intensive care. Sir, kindly deliver it your session. Thank you, ma'am, for that kind introduction. I hope I'm audible. Slides are moving, I hope. Ma'am, can I start? Yes, slides are moving. You can start. Uh, thank you, sir. At the outset, I would like to thank Murlidhar sir and his team at ICA, ICA for the opportunity. And uh, today I'll be talking on basic hemodynamic monitoring. Now, the word hemodynamics is derived from the Greek words haima and dynamikos, which means blood and flow. So hemodynamics is concerned with the forces generated by the heart and the resulting motion of blood through the cardiovascular system. So hemodynamic monitoring is the intermittent or continuous observation of physiological parameters pertaining to the circulatory system with a view to early detection of need for therapeutic interventions. Now one can ascribe the birth to, of hemodynamic monitoring to the British anesthesiologist. And uh, he was uh, Dr. Clover because he was the one who emphasized that we should have uh, one's pulse, one's finger on the pulse while administering chloroform anesthesia. The word monitor originated from the Latin word monere, which means to warn. So hemodynamic monitoring 
which is a cornerstone in the management of critically ill patient, is used to identify cardiovascular insufficiency, its probable cause and response to therapy. So this is the most important thing. It is difficult to document the efficacy of monitoring because no device improves outcome unless it is coupled to a treatment that improves the outcome. So what is the importance of monitoring? Monitoring provides an early warning of adverse changes or trends before irreversible damage occurs. It reflects the physiologic homeostasis. It allows prompt recognition of adverse changes and it allows prompt recognition of responses to the therapeutic interventions that we perform in the intensive care unit. So, which is the most important monitor? The most important monitor is the uh, anesthesiologist with eternal vigilance. And this is amply embedded in our logo, both of the American Society of Anesthesiologists as well as the Indian Society of Anesthesiologists. So eternal vigilance is the most important monitor that we have. So coming to hemodynamic optimization, the ability to optimize hemodynamics to ensure adequate organ perfusion and improve clinical outcomes is one of the many holy grails in anesthesia and intensive care. But which hemodynamic targets should we aim to optimize the patient? It remains elusive and controversial. So apart from the traditional hemodynamic targets, there are many other hemodynamic parameters that are increasingly available, like the dynamic indices and the central venous oxygen saturation. So what are we actually worried about? We are, we are worried about whether we, we are going to cause tissue hyperperfusion. And what do we have to really monitor to prevent this. It should be that we should monitor whether we are giving adequate oxygen delivery. So what are the determinants of oxygen delivery? Oxygen delivery is nothing but the product of cardiac output and oxygen content. Oxygen content is dependent on the hemoglobin content, the oxygen binding capacity and the, uh, sorry, the oxygen bindings uh, of hemoglobin and the dissolved oxygen in blood. Cardiac output is nothing but the product of stroke volume and heart rate and stroke volume is dependent on afterload, preload and contractility of the heart. So if we are able to monitor the preload, afterload, and contractility, we should be able to do a good hemodynamic monitoring. So how do we assess adequate oxygen delivery? It could be from clinical estimation by looking at the skin, the skin temperature, the prolonged, uh, whether there is a prolonged capillary refill, whether the peripheries are cool, whether there is tachycardia, whether there is a reduced level of consciousness, and whether there is decreased urine output. So a good physical examination should be done. Similarly, you can rely on lab values of lactate and base excess. And finally, we can measure the cardiac output and the mixed venous oxygen saturation. So coming to the basic hemodynamic monitoring, the classical hemodynamic monitoring is based on invasive measurement of systemic pulmonary arterial and venous pressures and of cardiac output. Since organ blood flow cannot be directly measured in clinical practice, arterial blood pressure, despite its limitations, is used as an estimate for the adequacy of tissue perfusion. And how do we monitor that? We can monitor it non-invasively by using a, a BP cuff, and it can be either done automated using the oscillometric method or by your palpatory method by listening to the Korotkov sounds. Now, what are the indications of having an invasive arterial line? It is when you need continuous real-time blood pressure monitoring, when you anticipate pharmacologic or mechanical cardiovascular manipulation, when you require repeated blood sampling, when there is failure of indirect arterial blood pressure measurement, and when you uh, anticipate that you need supplementary diagnostic information from the arterial waveform. So for any uh, invasive setup, you need a pressurized bag of saline, a transducer, and a catheter, as well as a non-compliant tubing, which connects the catheter to the pressure transducer. So what is this pressure transducer? Pressure transducer is actually a piezoresistive semiconductor, which consists of a diaphragm, which is connected to four piezoresistors. And these, when the diaphragm is, uh, is uh, pushed, what happens is the, the two of the piezo uh, resistors are subjected to uh, radial stress and two of them are subjected to tangential stress. Which, and this is in turn connected to a Wheatstone bridge, which will give you the, uh, which will give you a reading of a voltage and which is converted into the blood pressure values. So it's very important that the transducer is located at the phlebostatic axis, that is the fourth intercostal space in the mid-axillary line. So if the transducer is up, you have a lower blood pressure. If the transducer is placed below this line, you get a higher blood pressure. For every inch that is above or below, you add two millimeters of mercury to the uh, real pressure. And the most common uh, arterial site that is used is the radial artery. The other arteries that can be used are the uh, ulnar, brachial, uh, femoral, uh, 
uh, dorsal spedis and the axillary artery. You can use ultrasound or you can use the palpatory method to uh, put in an arterial line. And it has been classically described as a triangulation technique where the uh, two sides of the triangle is one is the, uh, you know, the echo uh, probe and the echo probe line as well as the needle path. So both of them are on the two sides of a triangle and this should intersect at the point of interest. So initially when you put the uh, probe, it should be slightly standard towards the skin so that you can see the needle entering the skin. And later on, the, uh, the probe is made more perpendicular so that you can see the entry point into the vessel wall. This is just a picture of the, uh, the catheter entering into the arterial uh, cannula, into the arterial lumen. And we should have an optimally damped system. And this can be, uh, this can be tested by using a fast flush test or a square wave testing. You activate the snap or the pull tab on the flush device and look for the number of oscillations after the square wave. One to two oscillations is the optimally damped system. And if you have more than two oscillations, it's under damped. The under damped problem is you will overestimate the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressures may be underestimated. If you have less than one oscillation, that means it's an overdamped system and there is underestimation of your systolic blood pressure. So the arterial line, it's a easy to set up. It's a real-time blood pressure monitoring. There's beat to beat waveform display and the disadvantage is that it's invasive and the complications of risk of hematoma, pseudo aneurysm formation and infection. Next, we come to the central venous pressure uh, lines. So the indications are a major operative procedures involving large fluid shifts, major trauma, surgical procedures with high risk of air embolism so that you can aspirate the intracardiac air, frequent venous blood sampling if required, chronic drug administration, inadequate peripheral uh, intravenous access and total parental nutrition are some of the indications for placing a central venous catheter. The most common site that we all use is the internal jugular vein and it is the Sedilots triangle, which is the landmark for uh, putting in a central venous line into the IGV. And we use the uh, Seldinger technique. It can be done uh, either by the uh, ultrasound probe or uh, by uh, palpatory method. And if, it is, if you're not using an ultrasound probe, you have to do a Fabian test. It's uh, advisable to use the ultrasound probe because of the anatomical variations as you can see in this picture here. So, uh, that's one. That's the way of putting in an ultrasound uh, mediated uh, IJV. Similarly, you can use the subclavian uh, vein for uh, cannulation, and it can be both the supraclavicular or the infraclavicular approach. In the infraclavicular approach, you can use the subclavian shrug technique, where you can ask the patient to shrug the uh, shoulders. And in the shrugging, what happens is the clavicle is lifted off the subclavian vein, which creates a window, and the uh, vein is accessible to ultrasound. Similarly, the shrugging also helps in uh, making a more gentle angle with the brachiocephalic vein, and this should facilitate smooth passage of the wire into the brachiocephalic vein. So there are a lot of advantages and disadvantages of each location. Internal jugular vein, uh, the, there's less risk of pneumothorax, but there is a risk of carotid artery puncture. Femoral vein that's having the highest risk of infection. And subclavian vein has the highest risk of pneumothorax, but it happens to be the most comfortable for conscious patients. Now, there are different waveforms for these uh, for the CVP waveform. The CVP waveform, uh, you have positive waves A, C, and B, and negative waves of X and Y. A is due to atrial contraction. C is due to the pushing in of the uh, tricuspid valve because of the uh, isovolumic contraction. X is due to the the X descent is due to the um, due to the ejection phase wherein the tricuspid valve along with the base of the heart moves towards the apex. The V wave is due to the filling of the atria and the Y wave is because of the um, opening of the tricuspid valve and uh, uh, the uh, emptying of the atrial contents into the uh, ventricle. Now, occasionally you can see an H wave. This is seen when uh, uh, patients have bradycardia with a higher CVP. So central venous catheter, the advantages are easy to set up and it's good for uh, giving uh, vasoactive medications. The disadvantages are it mostly does not reflect the actual RIP in most situations. And there are multiple complications like infections, thrombosis, and vascular erosions. The third 
thing is regarding the pulmonary artery catheter. Pulmonary artery catheter was uh, introduced into clinical practice by William Gans and Jeremy Swain. And uh, they were considered as the gold standard from 1970 to around 2000. But from 2000 onwards, the Pac-Man trial with the ESCAPE trial, uh, the, uh, there are a lot of complications from PA catheters and PA catheters fell into disrepute. And there were many, art, many uh, publications uh, uh, suggesting that. And 50 years down the line, uh, in 2020, uh, there was an editorial in the European Society of Cardiology. They said that's a very reliable assessment with bedside monitoring, with continuous monitoring, and a comprehensive phenomenal approach. However, because of safety concerns, and it requires skills to implant, and there is difficulty in interpretation, and because of the advent of ECHO, this is no more, no more used in the uh, clinical critical care practice because there is no proven benefit. And if you look at the number of uh, PACs inserted over the years, it has been coming down. And we all know that once the PA catheter is introduced into the uh, right atrium, the balloon is inflated and you get the characteristic uh, the CVP trace. And once it enters the RV, there is an increase in the systolic blood pressure. And the moment it enters the PA, the diastolic blood pressures go up and then you get the uh, wedge tracing. So what are we trying to measure with the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Well, it shows you the, uh, it correlates to the left atrial pressure. And if you have a normal mitral valve and the normal uh, left ventricular compliance, ultimately you can estimate the left ventricular and diastolic volume, which is the uh, actual preload for the left ventricle. And ideally this should be situated in the uh, zone three of the west zone, the PA catheter should be situated there because this is one area where the pulmonary alveolar pressure is less than both the arterial and venous, and there is a direct link. And what are the indicators that the PAC tip is in the west zone three? It is the PA wedge pressure is less than the diastolic pressure by one to five, and the wedge pressure alters less than 50% of the increase in peak. So this is, these are some of the x-rays showing you the proper placement. It can either go into the left side or into the right side. And if you're on to the right side, you should make sure that it doesn't cross the proximal part. It should not go beyond one centimeter of the mediastinum. And this picture here is showing you an improper placement where it is uh, placed too deep. And here the patient can develop pulmonary infarction. And if you wedge, it could like, lead to a rupture. The POP waveform is again similar to the uh, CVP waveform. But it is important that you measure the waveform at end expiration. How do you locate end expiration? With spontaneous breathing, you can locate waveform just before the pressure declines with inhalation. And with mechanical breathing, the waveform just before pressure rise with inhalation. This is shown here. So there are a lot of parameters that we can derive from the PEC. That is the CVP, the pulmonary artery wedge pressure, the temperature of the patient, cardiac output. And we can have derived values like the stroke volume, the systemic vascular resistance and the peripheral, oh, sorry, the pulmonary vascular resistance. Also, it can be used to find out the uh, cardiac output using the thermodilution technique. And what happens here is you inject uh, room temperature saline into the right atrium and uh, the at the tip, there is a thermistor which detects the change in temperature and the area under the curve is inversely proportional to the rate of blood flow in the PA, which is equal to the cardiac output. So you can see here after, if you have a high cardiac output, you have a smaller area under the curve. And if you have a large, if you have very low cardiac output, you have a larger temperature drop leading to a larger area under the curve. And three readings are taken together and the average is displayed on the monitor. The next important variable that you can detect is the mixed venous oxygen saturation. And the mixed venous oxygen saturation is, uh, it shows you, it is dependent on the cardiac output hemoglobin the oxygen consumption and the oxygen saturation. And we have a value of around 60 to 70, which is normal. And uh, it has been shown that the central venous and the mixed uh, venous saturation are almost uh, parallel, go, in, go together. So you can, instead of using the mixed venous, you can correlate it with your central venous, uh, this one. And you have mass catheters for that, that is the precept catheter. And you can have some oxygen delivery parameters also from your uh, PA catheter. You can find out the arterial oxygen content, the mixed venous oxygen content, and the oxygen delivery and oxygen consumption. So there are certain conditions where the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is more than the LVEDP. This is when the alveolar pressure is more than 
uh, it's when the elevator pressure is more. This is seen when you have positive pressure ventilation, high levels of PEEP, increased intrathoracic pressure or left atrial myxoma or mitral valve disease. It is less than the LVEDP when you have a non-compliant left ventricle as in ischemia, hypertrophy or in aortic regurgitation. The possible clinical indications for a PAC are right-sided heart failure, severe left-sided heart failure, cardiogenic or septic shock with multiple organ failure. There are a lot of contraindications. The absolute contraindications are severe tricuspid or pulmonary stenosis, right atrial or right ventricular mass, and tetralogy of fallow. The pulmonary artery catheter also comes with the continuous cardiac output monitoring, where the instead of giving the cold saline or the room temperature saline, here there is an electric filament which intermittently heats the right side of the heart, and the temperature change is detected at the tip of the PAC. There are a lot of complications similar to the uh, CVP complications and the other special complications are right bundle branch block, a PA rupture and pulmonary infarction. Another very important thing that you can detect from the arterial line is the, uh, the probability of giving preload responsiveness, finding out. So hemodynamic management is a constant daily challenge. You should give just the right amount of fluid. How do you decide that? You should know where in which part of this Frank Starling curve you are located. If you're in the steep part, you are fluid responsive. In the other part, you are the flat part, you are fluid unresponsive. CVP and pulmonary artery occlusion pressures are no more uh, considered to be reliable. They are static and it's just like tossing a coin. So nowadays you find the changes in arterial pressure during mechanical ventilation. You have algorithms embedded in most of the monitors now, which give you the uh, pulse pressure variation. And if you have a pulse pressure variation that is less than 10, you don't require fluid, but more than 15 fluid is indicated. And the area under the curve is maximum for pulse pressure variation, which is supposed to be most reliable. But this is reliable only when the patient is on a mechanical ventilator and has uh, sinus rhythm. And suppose he's not on a ventilator, you can use either the passive leg raising test as well as the end expiratory occlusion test. But both these require uh, proper echocardiography or some other method to monitor the increase in cardiac output. So ultimately, after finding all these things, there are only three therapeutic options left with you. Either you can give a vasopressor, volume expansion, or an inotrope. So if there is vasodilatation, which you can detect by looking at the diastolic blood pressure or your systemic vascular resistance, you give a vasopressor. If the dynamic indices tell that there is preload responsiveness, give fluid. But when do you stop giving fluid? You can do a lung ultrasound and see this fluid, then you stop giving fluid, or you can use the transpulmonary thermodilution and you can look at the extravascular lung. Impaired contractility can be detected by using echocardiography and you can uh, decide whether you want to give a inotrope. So after you uh, optimize your macro circulatory endpoints, always look at the tissue perfusion based endpoints like the arterial lactate and the capillary refill time and the urine output. Always don't forget the clinical examination. So summarizing, you should integrate all the values to solve the hemodynamic puzzle as quickly as possible so that the patient does not suffer. So the, remember the five T's, the target population, select high-risk patients initially, the timing of the intervention, you should start very early in the period, in the preoperative period itself, the type of interventions, uh, you can give fluid, vasopressors, rhinotropes, the target variables should be the blood flow variables and the target value should be personalized. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, sir, for your excellent deliberation. Uh, now we must go to the chat box. Any question is there? Questions will be answered at the end of the four talks. Uh, after all the sessions are over? Yeah, of all the all the sessions are over. That is the arrangement. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, sir. Now we'll go for the next session. Dr. Bupesh, can you invite uh, Satyan Parida? Yeah. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm Dr. Bupesh. Uh, th and uh, the next topic uh, for today's uh, CME is uh, perioperative hypotension and outcomes. 
and this will will be presented by dr satyam parida who is professor at uh, at the department of anesthesiology and critical care at a prestigious institute jipmer pondicherry his area of interest is cardiac anesthesiology and critical care and he has multiple awards in his credit dr satyam parida please go ahead Am I audible, sir? Am I audible, sir? Yeah. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Sir. Right. Uh, thank you. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Uh, so thank you very much, sir. Thank you for the kind introduction. And thank you, ICA, for having me here. So this, of course, is my first brush with the Indian College of Anesthesiologists. And I must confess that I'm absolutely humbled to be speaking before a panel that, uh, uh, that has people who probably answer to the um, query of the who's who of anesthesia science in India. Uh, and thanks to all of you there in the audience who have come to attend this session. I hope I'll be able to make some sense out of the um, data that I'm going to display before you. So this will be the objectives of my lecture. Uh, firstly, to be able to establish a relationship between perioperative hypertension and post-operative adverse outcomes in the context of non-cardiac surgery. Uh, we understand that cardiac surgery is a totally different kettle of fish, so we'll not be going to that. Uh, I will be attempting to report the strengths of associations for various uh, blood pressure thresholds and post-operative adverse outcomes. Uh, I will also, uh, hopefully by the end of the lecture, be able to make a strong case for, uh, for uh, conducting more and more prospective interventional trials, especially for certain vulnerable subsets of patients, as also for certain uh, organ-specific outcomes. So here we go. Uh, the problem with perioperative hypertension has always been that despite anesthetizing patients for decades together, we really have no consensus on actually how this entity needs to be defined. And that's what was actually acknowledged in this uh, rather older systematic review, which seemed to demonstrate that uh, uh, that uh, despite uh, that, depending upon how you define hypertension, whether as a certain um, a decline from the baseline or as a certain absolute threshold value, depending upon whether you took systolic blood pressure measurements or whether you took mean arterial blood pressure measurements, the incidence of perioperative hypertension could be widely variable. And 15 years down the line, nothing much really seems to have changed. Monk and colleagues were some of the first uh, uh, authors to actually demonstrate an association between perioperative hypertension and postoperative mortality. This, of course, was intraoperative systolic hypertension that they were talking about, which was defined as a decline in blood pressure, in systolic blood pressure below 80 millimeters of mercury, but the signals of harm in their uh, study with respect to one-year mortality was extremely palpable with a relative risk of 1.036 per minute of exposure. So this is about organ-specific outcomes. The authors were looking to relate perioperative hypertension with acute kidney injury. And they found that uh, at two thresholds of mean arterial pressure, at less than 55 and less than 60 millimeters of mercury, for exposures of 11 to 20 minutes duration, the association with acute kidney injury was quite palpable. And uh, although, although the odds ratios for both of these thresholds were, were quite different, the, the results were undeniable. So this also brings into concept the, uh, this also puts into focus the concept that uh, it's not just the absolute value of mean arterial pressure that matters, but also the overall duration of exposure, much like an area under the curve actually. So this is again another data set that deals with organ specific outcomes, very large retrospective data set, more than 30,000 patients. Now we already always know that uh, uh, hypertension is associated with poor organ perfusion and organ injury, but these authors were able to put a certain number to that. So they demonstrated that below 65 millimeters of mean arterial pressure, the 
uh, the, the possibility, the risk of harm to the kidneys on the left panel and to the myocardium on the right panel go up substantially. This also was from the same authors, from the same study, in fact. And uh, this uh, again integrates, this uh, graph again integrates the concept of having, ha looking at the, both the mean arterial pressure thresholds as well as the overall duration of exposure. So if you look at the graph here, even durations of exposure of as little as one to five minutes at mean arterial pressures below 55 millimeters of mercury were associated with an escalated odds of more than 30% with regard to acute kidney injury and cardiac complications. This was uh, one of the older systematic, uh, sorry, one of the rather newer systematic reviews which was published. Uh, and uh, again, a very large data set, more than 42 studies went into the ultimate analysis. Uh, and the selling point of this systematic review was that the authors were able to place certain thresholds of mean arterial pressure and related to perioperative outcomes. So if you look at the uh, panel on the extreme right, which demonstrates the risk of organ injury, the authors were able to show that at prolonged uh, periods of exposure, prolonged durations of exposure, which they defined as greater than or equal to 10 minutes, even mean arterial pressures below 80 millimeters of mercury were associated with definite risk of organ injury. Although these risks thankfully were low risk uh, as evidenced by uh, odds ratios of between 1 to 1.04. That's the area which has been, that's the panel, those are the panels which have been put in yellow. And this low risk for organ injury could be demonstrable even for lower durations of exposure of greater than or equal to five minutes when the blood pressure thresholds decline to less than 70 millimeters of mercury. The low risk then became high, moderate risk, sorry, which are the brown panels on the right, uh, when blood pressure thresholds decline to 60 to 65 millimeters of mercury for durations of exposure greater than or equal to five minutes. And when the, when, the, when the blood pressure thresholds decline to 50 to 55 millimeters of mercury, these moderate risks of organ injury were demonstrable for any duration of exposure. Again, the moderate uh, risk of organ injury became high risk, which are the panels on red when the blood pressure threshold was below 65 millimeters of mercury for greater than or equal to 20 minutes, less than 50 millimeters of mercury for greater than or equal to five minutes, and less than 40 millimeters of mercury for virtually any duration of exposure. So let's take a pause here and, and think about what this systematic review actually tells us. It tells us that even at blood pressure thresholds below 80 millimeters of mercury, below 70 millimeters of mercury, levels which we have always considered innocuous in the perioperative setting, there still exists a definite risk of organ injury. Thankfully, however, those less risks have been demonstrated as low risks, which is, which is some food for thought. So the problem with many of the systematic reviews, as with many of the much of the evidence in perioperative hypertension research, is that most of them are plagued with a lot of heterogeneity. So there is a variation in the characteristics of the patients chosen, so the age groups of the patients chosen may vary. There are differences in the kind of procedures that, that have been selected. Some may be as wide as non-cardiac surgeries, some may be as narrow as thoracic aortic aneurysms, or for that matter, gastric bypass surgery. So no hem homogeneity to that. And then of course, there is the problem of a non-uniform definition of perioperative hypertension, which we have already talked about. And finally, even the post-operative adverse outcomes have been defined, analyzed, and reported in variable ways. And a result of all this heterogeneity in the evidence base means that authors often have to resort to various conversions and assumptions in order to be able to merge the definitions of perioperative hypertension as well as the strengths of associations in order to uh, represent the data in a qualitative manner. And a uh, fallout of all this is that it's extremely difficult to actually point out a particular cutoff of blood pressure and say, this is the blood pressure that all clinicians need to target beyond below which patients might be harmed. Much of the data, much of the evidence also is from retrospective data. And although retrospective data are good for demonstrating associations, which indeed they do, uh, between perioperative hypertension and postoperative outcomes, a causal relationship between perioperative hypertension and outcomes is not forthcoming from the data that 
we have as evidence base so far. So we talked about variations in the way hypotension has been defined. And therefore, it would be interesting to check out whether the methods which have been used to uh, report the severity of hypotension would actually have an impact on the overall uh, strength of association with post-operative outcomes. And this was just such an attempt where the authors used 12 different methods to statistically model perioperative hypotension in order to check out the strength of association with two post-operative outcomes, those of acute kidney injury and myocardial injury. So the 12 methods that were chosen were, are given on the right. They were included such methods like the yes or no method, whether hypotension was present at all or not, the number of hypotensive episodes, the total duration of hypotensive episodes, so on and so forth. 12 different methods were chosen. The authors also chose eight different thresholds of, high, of, of blood pressure. Uh, and uh, four of these thresholds were based upon a certain percentage decline from baseline and four of them were absolute values. Uh, of which two were systolic blood pressure and two were mean arterial blood pressures. And after going into all such trouble, the authors concluded that the threshold to define hypotension as well as the method chosen to model hypotension actually uh, affects the association of hypotension with perioperative outcomes. And as a result of this, the studies on perioperative hypotension were, were extremely uh, uh, were less comparable and the clinical application of these studies, of the results of these studies were dubious. So this was Cleveland Clinic data where the authors were actually looking to uh, see whether uh, defining hypertension in variable ways, either as a percentage reduction from baseline or as an absolute value of mean arterial pressure would, uh, would actually um, affect the uh, incidence of uh, organ injury that was resulting from uh, such hypertension. So for purposes of this study, they compared a 20 25% reduction from baseline, uh, which, uh, which was compared with a mean arterial pressure less than 65 millimeters of mercury. And the authors concluded that whichever way you define perioptic hypertension, the, pay, the, the harm signals were extremely palpable were extremely strong for all sorts of organ injury, whichever way the definition was made. The problem with defining perioperative hypertension as a certain percentage reduction from baseline, however, is that we really do not know what the true baseline for a certain patient is. Typically, it should be the blood pressure that the patient actually maintains in his domestic existence, in his day-to-day -day life, carrying out his day-to-day -day activities, but we have no good way of assessing that. So in the absence of such knowledge, it might be worthwhile to actually fix up a certain value of hypotension, which in this case was 65, certain value of mean arterial pressure, which in this case was 65 millimeters of mercury and target that, hoping that things turn out good with our patients. So again, another retrospective review, nearly 900 patients from two university hospitals, vascular surgical patients, and the authors were checking out the association between perioperative hypertension and myocardial injury. And for purposes of this study, they defined perioperative hypertension as a greater than 40% decrease in mean arterial pressure. And what the authors found was that when there was exposure to a cumulative duration of greater than 30 minutes at these definitions of hypertension, the incidence of myocardial injury was substantial. However, what I found very interesting about the study was this particular graph, which seemed to suggest that patients who had higher mean arterial pressures, higher baseline mean arterial pressures, actually spent much more time in the perioperative hypotension threshold so what this means is that the hypertensive patients, just the kind of patients that we would want to avoid any hemodynamic perturbations in, given our knowledge about the autoregulatory thresholds and all that, they were the patients who actually had greater incidence of hypotension as defined by, uh, as, as per these definitions of hypertension that the authors have chosen, which to my mind means Remember that this is a retrospective review uh, study. So this, to my mind, means that the authors actually were targeting, the, I mean, sorry, the clinicians uh, who were involved in the study were actually targeting certain absolute values at blood pressure and not really uh, were they concerned with a certain uh, percentage decline from a reference value. So we have talked so far about retrospective studies. Let us come to some randomized controlled trials then. And this is one such trial which uh, randomized 
chronic elderly hypertensives, sorry, elderly chronic hypertensives rather, into three target mean arterial pressure ranges of 65 to 79 millimeters of mercury, 80 to 95 millimeters of mercury, and 96 to 110 millimeters of mercury. The subjects in this uh, study were all undergoing major abdominal surgical procedures. And what the authors demonstrated was that having the target blood pressure at 980 to 95 millimeter mercury range seemed to uh, work wonders for the incidence of API, which was much lower as compared to the higher as well as the lower uh, targets of mean arterial pressure. The incidence of stroke and mortality did not significantly differ between all three groups. And although these results are quite impressive, one must one cannot help comment that the inclusion and exclusion criteria that were taken for this RCT were quite strict. And therefore, the generalizability of this RCT, uh, of the results of this RCT for uh, other population subsets may be quite limited. Yet another uh, randomized control trial, this was uh, Emmanuel Fetier's group, which uh, checked out the possible, the, the, the benefits of having a protocolized blood pressure management, uh, protocolized in the sense that they used vasopressor infusions to keep the systolic blood pressure within 10% of a reference value. Uh, they compared this type of management with what they defined as a standard treatment group, which was basically a reactive management of blood pressure. The clinicians were instructed to react to a, to a drop in blood pressure below 80 millimeters of mercury systolic or a 40% decline from baseline. And uh, they were able to demonstrate in no uncertain terms that there was at least a 30% risk reduction with regard to post-operative organ injury when they use this kind of protocolized management of blood pressure using vasopressure infusions to keep it within very narrow ranges. Uh, again, one cannot, uh, however, uh, help observing that the standard treatment group with Futier and his uh, colleagues had defined is not really something that represents current clinical care. No one really waits for the blood pressure to drop below 80 millimeters of mercury systolic prior to treating those these days. So I will end up with uh, um, this uh, slide on post-operative hypertension. Excuse me, it's a very busy slide, but what I want you to focus on are the colored dots on the slides, which uh, demonstrate that uh, not only is this, this again is from um, Ashish Khanna's group, which has done a lot of work on, who has done a lot of work on post-operative hypertension. And this seems to demonstrate that uh, post-operative hypertension is extremely common in the post-operative period. Uh, and that it is substantially associated with organ injury across all organ systems, but most, most prominently with acute kidney injury. Not only that, post-operative hypertension in this data set was independently associated with, uh, with, with organ injury, with organ dysfunction, irrespective of whether there was associated intraoperative hypertension or not. So, with or without intraoperative hypertension, postoperative hypertension itself can cause, uh, can wreak severe damage. And uh, let's remember that postoperative blood pressures are something which we do not measure as meticulously as we do in the intraoperative period. So that's again something, uh, so something where we have to um, improve our clinical practice with. So I will conclude with the following take home messages. Firstly, that uh, there seems to be some evidence that uh, at mean arterial pressures less than 80 millimeters of mercury, there could still be some risk for organ injury, all, especially when the duration of exposure is substantial, although overall these risks seem to be mild. The risks, however, seem to escalate as the blood pressure thresholds come down and with increased durations of exposure to these lower blood pressure thresholds. Overall, the evidence base is such that uh, the, there is a lot of heterogeneity with regard to the kind of patients that are chosen for trials, the way hypotension has been defined, and the way post-operative outcomes have been defined as well, because of which it's, it's, it's really extremely difficult to actually uh, designate one particular blood pressure as a safe blood pressure above which we should maintain all our patients. But given all the data that I have looked at, I would assume that 65 millimeters of mercury would seem to be a 
uh, a reasonable range of blood pressure to maintain in most of our subjects, given that below this, the risk of organ injury becomes high risk. You know, if you remember the red panels. Uh, however, a more uh, discerning clinician might well disagree with me. And finally, uh, I would make a call for requirement of more prospective interventional trials, especially with regard to certain vulnerable uh, patient subsets and to uh, uh, targeting certain organ specific outcomes in order to answer questions about perioperative hypertension better. I understand there will be ethical uh, challenges in actually conducting these trials, but I'm sure intelligently that uh, um, uh, there's a design trials in this regard can be conducted and would be helpful for helping us to guide clinical decision making uh, with regard to this topic in the future. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Satyam, for a, a nice elaboration on the topic, and particularly highlighting the uh, perioperative instance of hypotension and the uh, association of this uh, with the post-operative outcome, and also highlighting that uh, there is all those uh, association, but we don't know the causal relationship uh, has not been established so far. And uh, uh, the point to be highlighted again is this there is no single digit which suits Absolutely. to the every patient so that has to be individualized the, yes. and and another issues of uh, like perioperative hypotension definition are still is not clear so there is the clear cut data from what we have yes. there is no uh, clear cut uh, solution for those so uh, still we wait till the proper definition and the causal relationship has to be established. So there are few RCTs that has shown uh, post-operative uh, poor outcome with a different uh, organ dysfunction, but those are few. So with this, uh, we'll uh, end with this talk. And for uh, uh, next talk, we have our co-panelist, Dr. Vidya Patil. She's a professor and head of department at uh, Department of Anesthesiology as at Vijayapura. Uh, Dr. Vidya, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. And I thank uh, the organizers of this uh, webinar for the opportunity given to me. We now have the next speaker, Dr. Niranjan Waze. He will be delivering a lecture on echocardiography as a hemodynamic monitor. So uh, coming to his introduction, Okay. Uh, Dr. Niranjan was a, is a diplomat, advanced PE and BE. He is a fellow cardiothoracic anesthesiologist from US. He is chief in cardiac anesthesia, Department of Heart Transplant and Advanced Cardiac Surgery at Sir H. N. Reliance Foundation Hospital and Research Center, mm -hmm. Mumbai. He is also a teacher uh, for cardiac anesthesia fellowship and he is also a director simulation echocardiography training course. Uh, his uh, coveted publications are two, he has published two prospective studies in annals of cardiac anesthesia and three case reports in uh, journal of cardiovascular anesthesia and he has also published uh, one letter to the editor in anesthesia journal. Over to you, sir, Dr. Niranjan Nozi. Thank you, ma'am, for the kind introduction. Can you can everyone hear me? Thank you, ma'am, for the kind introduction. Uh, good evening. You are heard, sir. You are audible. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Good, good evening, everyone. Thank you, uh, Ika. Thank you, Dr. Kanti Mulinder, sir, for uh, this opportunity. I just like to uh, uh, go. Uh, it's a very short time to go through this extensive talk, but I'll try to give a brief overview about how echo can be helpful in. Uh, uh, in management of uh, hemodynamics. Okay, so uh, there are so various sorry, papers. Sorry to interrupt you, sir. So can you please make it a full screen? It's not in full oh, yeah. screen. Oh, sir. yeah. Yes, yes. Is, is it okay now? Yes, yeah, so perfect. Okay. So there are several papers uh, which have mentioned uh, the role of echocardiography in management of uh, for uh, in hemodynamic uh, challenge uh, patients. 
in critical care as well as emergency medicine. Whereas echo can be used to rapidly identify the type of shock. It can be used to titrate your management. It, it is further used to monitor how you are, uh, uh, the uh, monitor if the management is going appropriate, the appropriate direction. It can also help to uh, fine tune your mentality settings and effectively uh, bring about uh, change in the patient outcome. So uh, earlier in the human uh, challenge, uh, challenging situations, critical situations, the the earlier protocol used to be give fluids, start decline, start ion flow stressors, and at the end, if nothing works, then you used to do the echo. But in the current guidelines, in any hemodynamic uh, unstable situation, the first thing what you do is do an echo. So echo is the first tool that has to be used, uh, is recommended to be used in ICU, ER, periop situations where there's hemodynamic instability. And there are several papers there. Uh, it, it should not be used only for the initial diagnosis, but it should also be used for continual monitoring. And it should also be used to titrate uh, your, your change in management, whether it's working in the right direction. Uh, if you ha There are several uh, types of uh, echo can be used. There are focused echoes. They might be named uh, differently. Transthoracic echo, transesophageal echo, lung ultrasound, fast, weight, rush. They're named all in different ways, but essentially they serve the same purpose of finding out what's going wrong with the patient. Uh, the, the focused echo here in point of care ultrasound has, has been shown to have a very short learning curve for the basic echoes. Uh, given in a 10-hour course, 84% uh, of the people who are trained in a 10-hour course were able to get uh, their uh, identify equally, uh, the interpretation was equally good to the, to the experienced echocardiographers. 40% of them were able to even titrate the management right direction. So primarily what we use essentially, uh, since this talk is uh, for, uh, primarily with perioperative things, uh, we use the transthoracic echo or transthesable echo, comparing the two. The transthoracic uh, echo is easily available, uh, less expertise is required for that. It is less invasive. Even the patient is anticoagulated, uh, it's, uh, it's less harmful, it's, uh, it's safer to use that. Maintaining uh, 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 is, is can be an issue. However, the, the problem with transthoracic echo can be uh, if the, if you are if it's a perioperative situation and the surgeon is working out, it might not provide the uh, most reliable fields. You might be uh, encroaching on the sterility. There is limited working space available with surgeon operating, and uh, with it, it might not be it might not give good imaging in, in ventilated patients. Compared to that, transesophageal echocardiography is uh, it has better resolution. It is it's the best modality to interrogate a mitral valve aortic. Uh, anything posterior sector of the heart. Uh, it, it is the choice of this thing to see and it, it won't, uh, it will give better imaging in ventilated patients. Uh, since it is, uh, it does not interview the patient uh, field where the surgeon is in the surgical field, it has, it, ha it has a scope of maintaining better sterility, better working space. Uh, uh, the T sees uh, the SVC better, the transthoracic sees the IVC better. And the only thing about TE is it might, it might not be easily available. It is, it is a little more invasive and uh, expertise required for doing it, performing the TE. So if you compare transthoracic and transesophageal, uh, most of the findings on in 50% of times, whatever findings of transthoracic have been confirmed by the TE, uh, by the TOE. What in 40%, 35% of people, however, TE has revealed a new diagnosis requiring a new change in therapy. In 12% of those patients, T determined a diagnosis which the transthoracic echo had even failed to pick it up. So it just clearly shows the superiority of TE over transthoracic in uh, picking out uh, the cause of hemodynamic, uh, hemodynamic instability. So one of the commonest causes that you could pick, up, pick out, which are the segmental ball properties. So if the patient is uh, hemodynamic unstable situation, there's cardiac shock, it can pick out the RWMS and we can act accordingly. The other thing is the core permanent, aortic dissection, the preload of the heart. The other thing that can pick up is the dynamic LVOT obstruction and LA appendage. So uh, as I just mentioned, as uh, all the talks have been uh, mentioned, uh, all there are different, different types. So in a hemodynamic instable situation, in the case, case of shock, we need to find out what, uh, what is the problem and address accordingly. So essentially shock can be uh, diagnosed as uh, an obstructive shock, a cardiogenic shock, uh, the uh, uh, preload, a hypobolic shock, with the preload low, and finally, if all three are missing, it it, it it becomes a vasodilatory shock by exclusion. 
However, by echo, we can objectively classify it as, as a vasodilatory shock. So coming to obstructive shock, the classical, uh, the classical scenario when you can have an obstructive shock is a case of tamponade. So here you have an image of a transthoracic echo. Any RA systolic collapse, uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, you have the uh, mid papillary review, and you can see this is heart. This is the pericardium, and this equilucent dark area is all the, is the blood collected around the heart. So it, the quantity may not always matter. It's about the amount uh, acuity of the event that can cause uh, the tamponade. And tamponade is uh, a clinical event. Any small amount of clot sitting uh, causing RA systolic collapse or RV diastolic collapse, as is seen on the left hand side picture here, can also lead to tamponade. Second uh, case commonly uh, uh, see, you can see up on top is the case of pulmonary embolism. The right side, there is a video showing a four chamber view in the TE. And the, in the video, you can see, yeah, in the video, you can see the clot in the RA. I probably got dislodged. In the top left corner is the, is the ascending aorta short, uh, uh, short axis view, pulmonary artery. You can see the clot in the RP, right pulmonary artery loaded here. And there's a four chamber view. Which we have, you can see the RV, this is LA, LV, RA, RV. And the RV, which will be normally less than half the size of the LV, is almost more than the size of the LV. So it just shows that the RV is compromised with the, in, the, in acute pulmonary embolism. So this can be a common scenario of pulmonary embolism, even while the general anesthesiologists are managing the cases in a pro probably the orthopedic cases, where they can land up in, a, in such a situation, and echo can be of help. So this is another uh, this is another situation which is a, a cardiac surgical patient and uh, after after coming off uh, a bypass and coming in the ICU they had uh, is a hemorrhagic instability situation. So you can edit, you, can, you can see here the what's happened is this is a, a mid axis view long axis view. This is LA LV. This is the mitral valve. This is the aortic valve here and the aorta. This is a prosthetic valve here. This so is a perceivable uh, superless valve which was put. It has gone, it is, it has been malpositioned accidentally into too, too deep into the LVOT and preventing the opening of the pre, uh, preventing the opening of the mitral valve here. So uh, this have we had to go back on pump to rectify the position and things were sorted out. So obstruction can not be only static, it can even be dynamic obstruction. So on the left hand side of the, uh, both the images are of uh, mid surgical long axis view of the TE. This patient were, had hypertension, blood loss, and there was a, uh, it, for the hypertension, adrenaline was started, and uh, to the surprise, the pressure dropped even further. So no one knew what was happening. Excessive adrenaline for, uh, caused excessive tachycardia and further worsened the situations. So when echo was done, what you see on, uh, is, uh, is on the left side of the screen. You can see this is LA, LV, mitral, aortic valve, and this is the LVOT, where the arrow is pointing. It causes turbulence of flow. Similar image in a normal patient, the flow occurs without is a non turbulent flow. You can see homogeneous orange and blue out here. So, what was happening is a dynamic obstruction. It's a case of asymmetrical uh, hypertrophy, uh, hypertrophy, contrary hypertrophy of the LV, and uh, which gets in a, high, in a tachycardic situation where the LV gets underfilled, or in hypovolemic conditions where you are the, a lot of volume loss. Starting uh, adrenaline would not be uh, uh, would not have been the appropriate choice in this situation. So the treatment of choice was where we went down on the adrenaline, gave lots of fluid, started pressures, and the patient was uh, successfully bleed out. So this just goes to show the importance. We just starting adrenaline and or uh, uh, and vasopressors uh, blindly may not always help in all situations, and in fact, can worsen some situations. So this is a, a, a classical scenario. You can see this is aorta. Uh, this is the aorta and, and, uh, and a long axis view, and this is a flap out here. This is a descending aorta, short axis view, and this is a flap out here. So this is a classical case of aortic dissection, uh, picked up in the ER, and the patient goes earliest to the OT to get it rectified to prevent further deterioration of even lines. As you can see, the echo is helped here. The next you can see is the cardiogenic chart. Uh, you can I'll just play some here. This is a four chamber view on the left hand side here. LA, LV, RA, RV. This is LV is RV is smaller than LV. That's fine. But if you can see the LV is a little ballooned down and bigger, and there's a lot of stasis in the LV. This is called spontaneous echo contrast, and there's an indicator of a, a, a poor LV, dilated under functioning LV. On the right hand side is a bit papillary view. You can see here this is LV, and this is interventricular septum, and right, and this is the right ventricle. If you focus on the contractility of the segments, 
if you in the interaction wise is anterior this is inferior this is lateral and this is septal this is septum on the rv side so uh, we uh, you can clearly see that all the segments of the lv are not moving equally this anterior anterior lateral and septal part are moving well and the inferior lateral parts are not moving well so this is a classical case of visual wall abnormalities new onset post bypass surgery and we, we had to go uh, where you would have to address the the condition accordingly for, for this so what what i'm trying to give you this is the audience is uh, primarily non possibly primarily non cardiac i would like to uh, rather than going into excessive details of each each procedure each maneuver i would like to just uh, put forward how echo can be used qualitatively quality just by 2d imaging to bail ourselves out of any hemodynamic instability uh, unstable situation and it's not too difficult to think i just merely do it 2d imaging and a little color you can identify things so the, the earlier slide this here was qualitative imaging if you go quantitatively on the right, on the left hand side of the screen uh, uh, here the uh, top two help in uh, calculating the volumes and diastolic volume and systolic volume and if you subtract the two by formula you get a ejection fractions the left hand uh, the top uh, these two bottom images you can quantify them uh, the mid papillary view this is in systole on the right this is in diastole on the right you trace the borders you get the fraction area change in diastole and uh, systole and uh, by applying the uh, formula you get, you get the fraction area change which uh, which uh, which is a surrogate mar marker of the ejection fraction of the of the ventricle and the right hand side is red dot and all are is a, is are the classical examples of the global longitudinal strain anything less than 20 or less would be it would not indicate of a normal lv function also the pattern of uh, the strain would uh, would give us uh, enough hints to the type of uh, pathology we are encountering with there is next slide here uh, is a case of classical again the four chamber view this is la lv rar we would have seen the difference here is the right ventricle is much enlarged is much more bigger than the lv also you see that this is the septum which should be normally bowed to the right side is now bowing and bowing into the left side so this is a ghastly critical situation where uh, the pressures if you keep on filling the uh, which will cause a critical very critical uh, situation if not addressed appropriately on the right hand side is the same thing is the long axis u la lv uh, uh, this is the mitral valve this is the aortic valve and the flow in the aorta normally this should be seen as small chamber this is the right ventricle is is ballooned down into the lv so both are classical examples of a right ventricle failure this can happen pulmonary embolism there can be pressure overload like in a case of pulmonary embolism or there, there can be a volume overload as in a massive tr so this can be identified by the septal motion as as, as you have seen here the septal motion if the septum is bowing and uh, if septum is bowing into the lv side in systole it is it indicates a pressure overload possibly pulmonary embolism if it is bowing in the diastole it uh, indicate is indicate a massive volume overload possibly massive tr so it helps us it, in any case of cardiac shock you might the basic principles remain the same decrease the p load decrease the upload increase contractility however by differentiating without the echo we would not know whether there is left or right failure and by differentiating between left and right failure probably in rv failure we will start more of an i hope the choice of inopro could be milder known since this drops a pulmonary vasculature resistance much more than the other agents you might keep a very low cvp cvp is not a great guide of fluid responsiveness however it would be helpful here to see the rv preload and uh, uh, de uh, decrease i uh, use nitric oxide to decrease the pulmonary pulmonary uh, uh, flow so by no by echo you could not only um, diagnose cardiogenic shock but it also differentiate between the left and right heart failure and treat the patient accordingly this was a common scenario scenario for even patient uh, those people managing liver transplants so this is the next slide is earlier slide that was a qualitative assessment of rv this is a quantitative assessment of rv on the top side uh, uh, on the bottom here is i'm what showing the tapsy the tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion which should not be a no uh, less than 70 17 and on the top here is the s prime which is a tissue doppler and this this s prime is about the baseline it should be not less than 9 anything less than 9 would be indicative qualitatively about the poor rv function on the right hand side you see the uh, the the rv strain which also corresponds to the uh, patient outcome so 
uh, apart from the qualitative assessment, ECHO just uh, can be used uh, for quantitatively as well. ECHO provides and we can be used as any other cardiac output monitor. How and how do how do you do that? So the basic principle of area, area into flow, flow uh, is the VTI velocity time uh, calculation of the velocity of flows across that area, that particular area, is a VTI. You get a VTI velocity time integral. So if you calculate the area of this point and the flow across the VTI across, we can get uh, we can calculate the flow occurring across this point. So the point what we decide is LVOT. This is a mid social long axis view. This is LA, LV, mitral, and aortic valve. So these views are almost the standard view. So you don't need to have know all the views. Basic four or five views can be used to bail us out of many situations. This is standard mid social long axis view. Uh, okay, here, which will help you calculate the LVOT diameter. Assume the assumption here is the LVOT is a, is a circle. We calculate this diameter and gives the, the area is calculate, calculated by pi r square. And we play if we go to a deep transgastric view to get the velocity here. And there's the velocity we ought to get is a VTI, velocity time integral. When you get a velocity and you trace this, uh, the flow, uh, the velocity here, you get a VTI. Area pi r square into VTI will give us flow. The flow, flow is the stroke volume. Stroke volume to heart rate is the cardiac output. And by application of this formula, SVR is map minus CVP, mean arterial pressure minus CVP upon cardiac output, you get the systemic vascular resistance. If the SVR is low, you start pressures, it's a little dilatory uh, mesopelic trough. If it's high, you might use, uh, you might try to go down on the pressures or use some dilators. So we choose the deep transverse view because we had to have perfect alignment along uh, on, alongside the flow to, for better accuracy. So, uh, the, uh, so this is a deep transversal view, and if you, uh, the flow across is exactly parallel to the cursor, and that is why this view is selected. And the uh, tracings here are the VTI velocity time integrals, which I'll be speaking on in, in, in subsequent slides. The next situation is a hypervolumic shock. There are two terms which are important now to understand: are fluid status and fluid responsiveness. Fluid status means the total amount of fluid, uh, the content amount of fluid that that would be the central vascular system. Fluid response uh, was, was a term which we can precisely tell us whether if you give administer fluid to a patient is going to be responsive. So you administer fluid and the stroke volume increases by 15%. That means the patient's fluid responsive. So this uh, terminology has been coined because if you give excessive fluids unnecessary to a patient that uh, has that has impacted outcomes and a more ventilatory and ICU state. On the other hand, if you do give too less of fluids, it can uh, impact your renal and other uh, other organ functions. So the normally in the parameters of fluid responsiveness are divided into volume-based parameters and pressure-based parameters. Also, they can be divided. The volume-based parameters are better than the pressure-based parameters, and the dynamic parameters are better than the, than the static parameters. So it all, whether it's pressure-based parameters, volume-based parameters, both can have are static and dynamic, and the pressure, uh, the volume-based parameters and dynamic are the most accurate parameters. So these, uh, so uh, the echo also can give us static as well as dynamic parameters based on echocardiography. So if you see on the left hand side, uh, if you left hand side, this is a mid papillary view. This is commonest view again. We are seeing again and again. This is a uh, LV. Uh, this is septum and the RV. On the left hand side, if you can see the septum, all the walls of the LV are kissing. This is called a classical kissing ventricle. And the right hand side is a normal contractility. So the, it, the, this is static. You saying the state indicating the fluid status. So it might not. It's not the best view to, uh, to identify fluid responsiveness, but it is definitely a good view when the LV is empty to understand the LV is empty. On the left hand side, we can focus. The LV is totally empty. All the walls are kissing each other, and you can definitely be administered fluids. Uh, in the next slide, uh, there is a pressure slide. So the pressure pressure parameters by echocardiography. On the left hand side, on the top, you have the transmitter. You put a pulse through Doppler and transmitter gradients. So you get an E and A wave corresponding to the early diastolic killing phase and a late di late diastolic killing phase, and that can indicate your grades of diastolic dysfunction. On the lower uh, is the tissue Doppler, where you put pulse through Doppler on the lateral mitral angles, and you can see. See uh, how much the ventricular relaxation in the during the diastole. Uh, this is called E prime. So E by E prime, when this is the E wave, we get a value. E 
prime below we get a value is the ratio e by e prime is a negative lv evp lv and asteroid pressure so whatever parameter information is given by the pa catheter all uh, the what we want from the is the lv edp lv and asteroid pressure so that can be achieved by echocardiography so we have many uh, in uh, many the devices like flow track uh, and etc uh, using svv ppv and uh, indicating fluid responsiveness so they are non invasive and they good so they say more than 20 15 to the number they give fluids less than 15 or less than 13 as the number goes down it should not administer fluids however they don't focus on the number so uh, if, if you have a ppv or sv number of 8 7 6 you, you don't know whether you have the fluid is in you know not to give fluids but you do you know, uh, they don't indicate accurately whether the fluid content is excessive and you need to administer diuretics however in echo can help us in this condition so if you have you can use the static parameters pressure based parameters here and find the lv edp and you don't know uh, if the lv edp is high you know the pressure is excessively high on the the volume state is on the higher side and you might administer diuretics first of all you stop giving fluids and you may necessarily require uh, require to administer diuretics you can uh, confirm similar thing on lung ultrasound and see the vertical lines normally the in lung ultrasound you do not see the vertical lines vertical line is the b lines normally you would see the horizontal line they call the a line if you see multiple b lines and confluence confluent lines there's a it's a very good indicator that you need to probably diurese the patient and these b lines would arise much earlier than your oxygenation would fall on the right hand side uh, uh, of the same slide you can see that this is the bicable tubes this is the la ra svc on the right side ivc on the left side and uh, uh, and so if you put it in mode here you can see the collapsibility uh, collapsibility of the svc so svc is an intrathoracic organ and can be well evaluated by the te and the svc sensitivity and variability is more accurate than the uh, uh, is more accurate than the transthoracic echocardiogram uh, uh, that measures the ivc So IVC also can have a dynamic index, index that can pick up the ultrasound, which is the IVC distensibility, uh, uh, IVC, uh, IVC distance, uh, IVC collapsibility, and SVC distensibility. So these numbers, these uh, the distensibility index, indices, which is uh, we we get a maximum diameter and minimum diameter, and then you apply a formula max minus minimum upon the mean or the minimum to give you a number, and depending on the number, the number is high. Is uh, you give fluids, the number is less. You do not give fluids. So these are dynamic indices which are given provided by echocardiography, uh, which can act, uh, which are low learning curve, which can be safely applied to help us guide fluid therapy. So this is next slide is about the dynamic indices of fluid responsiveness, as I have spoken earlier in the earlier talks. So because of the heart rate interactions, uh, there are there is variation of stroke volume. And then that has picked up accurately by uh, by a monitor with, and it can be in the form of PPV pulse pressure variation or SVV stroke volume variations, which which, which accurately detect which are equal uh, amount of accuracy to tell us how, uh, which are very good indicators of fluid responsiveness. For stroke volume SVV we need a cardiac output monitor. For PPV we just need art art arterial tracing and the uh, and the variation and the number. However. Uh, the patient here has to be ventilated with 8 ml per kg tidal volume controlled ventilation and the tracheal should have been in a sinus rhythm so uh, uh, so in if you have an echo if the patient is not uh, uh, in sinus uh, patient is uh, is spontaneously breathing we can use echo to our advantage and uh, we can uh, uh, we, uh, we can use echo to our advantage so this is a formula of dynamic indices as i had mentioned before Of the SVC collapsibility, collapsibility index and the IV uh, and the IVC distensibility index. Echo can provide similar dynamic indices. As you are seeing, you see on the left hand side, you see the deep transgastric view. This is the LV here now. This is the mitral valve, and this is the LA. So L L LV inflow is this, and LV outflow is this, and this is the aortic valve. So L left ventricle. Aortic valve, uh, LVOT, and aorta. This this view is selected because this uh, the the flow here across the LVOT is exactly parallel to this cursor for accuracy. To put the cursor here, we put a pulse rate Doppler, and you get a VTI velocity in time integral as I had spoken you earlier about. If you trace the VTI and you trace all the readings, 
each flow is equivalent to the stroke volume of the of, of the patient. And if you see the variations of each of these tracings, you'll get an index. It will similar to the SVD stroke volume index. So to to tracing each thing, each uh, each uh, each of the tracings is a tedious task. So we might that each tracing if you trace, you get a VTI variation index. But it is a tedious task. You might choose to just see the maximum velocity here. So you might just choose to see the maximum velocity, peak velocity here, and it will give the S S so VTI max variation or aortic V max variation. So uh, lung ultrasound, as you all know, can be can be helpful. Uh, we can be picked up by uh, by transvascular echo uh, to uh, point out uh, uh, the B line, the A line, how much to fill or not to fill. So there are recent papers which show that transesophageal echocardiography can be used beyond to get information beyond the heart. So uh, uh, normally this is an uh, uh, A B. Uh, this is a first set of readings, second and third. The, if the probe is on the top of the aortic level, it, it, this and the second set of readings are at the mid surgical uh, portion of view level, and at below is a deep transgastric level. And if you, can, you turn the probe to left and right and interrogate the left and right pleura. So what we can get information, uh, what information we can get out of this? If you see this, you can see the uh, the lung sliding here on this video. Uh, this is the lung sliding. What you can see uh, so that that means that's normal, and you can see multiple vertical lines. So this this just indicates this is a cardiac surgical patient. And in case that if we have we are on the higher side of the flying flying starting curves, and we uh, and we might need to give a little peep or administer a little diuretics. We would, however, have to further confirm with diastolic indices of diastolic dysfunction. So that way we, can, we come to know uh, that whether to give fluids, whether to ventilate, and the peep, and that has had a positive impact. And this graph just shows using uh, TLS guided. TLS is trans esophageal lung ultrasound guided uh, administration of PEEP and diuretics has ha has had improved impact in earlier extubations in the ICU. Also on the right hand side you can see an image where uh, where this is a liver, this is a diaphragm and a collection of right dual effusion. Here this is the echolucent area in the uh, this thing. If it's post cardiac patient, if there's a massive collection, you can it can easily give us the cause of the collection. So trans issue utter this is what we are finding. The transitional utter sound has been used for not only cardiac, now when I extend the cardiac, but non cardiac causes, and not only thoracic, but not have, it has been extended, use, utility has been extended even to abdominal causes of uh, uh, abdominal causes of hemodynamic instability, like a hemoperitoneum. So, what you see now is not, uh, uh, this is not a liver, uh, this is not a lung, which is a pneumonic uh, lung, this is a liver here, this is a diaphragm. And this is a massive collection of hemoperitoneum on the left lobe of the liver, or the right lobe of the liver. This is the left lobe of the liver and massive collection here. You can see the dark line here is the diaphragm. So what happened is, uh, is there's a massive, when you go to a deep transgastric view, you normally anti-flex to see the, mid the heart. If you retroflex, you draw in more, uh, more of the, more of the uh, abdomen. And normally this liver is uh, in a close approximation to the diaphragm. But if you see this gap here, it just indicates that uh, there's a lot of collection there. The patient was subsequently, subsequently underwent an ultrasound abdomen and was moved to the OT for an uh, for an emergency exploratory laparotomy with a successful outcome. PE echo can is also useful in cardiac arrest. So what you do is uh, TE especially uh, the transfer as, uh, while giving chest compressions you won't be able to do transfer as echo. But if you have a TE probe slipped inside, what it does is it it helps us to identify. Yeah, whether the LV is uh, shows us the LV here and is the LV is adequately compressed. Secondly, it tells us uh, normally when you mid sternum if you apply pressure, it need not what you need to compress is the LV and not LVOT. Many a times it has been seen because of this echo in cardiac arrest, when the T is there, the appropriate point of compression is not, not generated. That might not give us effective CPR. So by T guided exists a uh, perfect uh, 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 compression of the LV. We can have more effective CPR and earlier so earlier uh, ROSC is achieved. Quality of CPR is improved. Not only that, if there's a it can also be of diagnostic utility as we have seen. If you see a lot of collection around the heart, it can help help us to identify the six areas in the six uh, the the, the tamponar and accordingly proceed uh, to a good outcome. It, it is a prognostic indicator as well. Like if there's if there's tamponade, that's a good outcome. If the heart, if the initial TE, if there's a cardiac stencil, 
those those uh, uh, resuscitation may not be uh, successful always. Uh, lastly, the T echo can also be used uh, in eCPR. Suppose you have a tube ROSC and you, uh, you the heart is not adequately still not adequately pumping, but you have a tube ROSC. You can use a T. Uh, you can use the T to uh, to uh, for the eCPR. Then you can you put this uh, uh, let us T remain there and it can let you guide the uh, vena echo cannulation. On the left hand side, you uh, you see here there's a bicycle view in the center, uh, LA RA and the guide wire here. On the left uh, top, you can see the cannula coming from the from the IVC and the venous drainage cannula for a VA ECMO. The tip has to face the SCCRA junction and there are multiple posts for to drain the drain the blood. So a prominent positioning of the venous drainage cannula is of paramount importance uh, while doing this thing. On below, uh, this is it's a video below. What you see is the Avalon cannula, with the single limb cannula for the v, for the VV ECMO, which uh, which uh, for which T is of paramount importance to identify the correct placement. Where the outflow outflow channel of that channel has to face the tricuspid valve. That's what is seen in the image. On the right hand side, you can see the deep transgastric view, and you can see the IVC. This is the hepatic veins. The appropriate positioning of cannula can, uh, to, uh, has to be confirmed in the in a venous drainage cannula in a VV echo. It should not be obliterated uh, during the the drainage of the hepatic veins. Finally, in a, in a, in my instable condition, echo can help you guide guide the IBB placement. Not only it can help you guide the placement of wire, as you can see, see here, it can also help you to uh, to confirm the position of the IBB. On the left hand side, simple view before starting. If you get a middle middle long axis view on the top, there you can see a one mitre MR. There's a little AR there. There's a little AR, AR there. So in excessive moderate to severe AR, a higher degree of AR is a contraindication to IVP. So it, the echo, early echo can also help you choose whether you should need to use IVP at, at, at all. Thank you. So there was extensive thing that brings to the end of my talk. There was extensive thing uh, to talk about on this, but I would, uh, I, given the limitation of time limit, I would just uh, wanted to uh, give you a brief overview of where echo can be applied, and it's not a difficult thing to do. Uh, if by mere qualitative assessment, it can help us uh, to bail us out in critically emerging and stable conditions. Uh, earlier, it was done by cardiologists, then by, by cardiac anesthesiologists, and now it should definitely be taken up by all the even the general anesthesiologists, intensivists, and uh, ER physicians. And that's our, here I would like to conclude. I would be happy to take any questions at the end of the session. Thank you, Dr. Niranjan. It's a wonderful session. Uh, is Dr. Mulidhar is there? Absolutely. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I'm absolutely here. I'm waiting to <laughs> start my talk. I'll do it in a little while. I'm just... Uh... Uh, can you see my screen there? Yes, yes. Uh, see, there are some four questions which are uh, highlighted here. Uh, we wanted to make it as an audience poll, but uh, the organizer said that it's not possible. So I request each of the panelists to address uh, the questions at the end of my talk. So the first question is, uh, all of the following are dynamic indices of preload, except you have to identify which one is not correct in that as a preload indicator. Second uh, is, it will be discussed at the end of my talk. Please wait. Huh? Please, this is for audience to note. Second question, IABP inflation is triggered by diacrotic notch, anacrotic notch, systolic pressure or diastolic pressure. Third one is flow track measures, all of the following except 
which one it does not measure you have to choose from that fourth one is extra vascular lung water may be determined by one of the following techniques is it flow track is it esophageal doppler is it ivc diameter or transpulmonary dilution with that i will start my begin my talk and uh, i would like to thank uh, the ICA for providing us the pro uh, platform. Uh, to begin with, I would like to say that achieving hemodynamic stability, where both macro and micro circulation is doing well during high risk surgery and in critically ill patients, is a formidable challenge. In fact, we have several, several parameters, both invasive and non-invasive, that guide us to administer fluids, vasopressors, inotropes, etc. And we have a concept of the goal-directed therapy, which utilizes these monitors to assess the cardiovascular system and guides us to intervene as necessary. But are we doing justice by going by one parameter? In fact, Dr. Satyan Parida mentioned that 65 millimeters of mercury mean arterial pressure is probably suitable, but we will just see how each patient is different. I'll be just touching upon physiology, what is autoregulation, what is protocolized versus personalized management, and at the end, we will see whether one size fits all. When we are targeting hemodynamic parameters, there are uh, two main uh, parameters, that is the para perfusion pressure and what is the oxygen delivery? What is the perfusion pressure and what is the oxygen delivery? That is how much blood is going at what pressure and how much oxygen it is carrying. These are the most important uh, parameters for optimization of uh, optimization of hemodynamics. So perfusion pressure, which is uh, uh, which is determined by the mean arterial pressure minus the central venous pressure, dependent upon cardiac output and vascular resistance, and cardiac output in turn depends upon the heart rate and the stroke volume. When you come to oxygen delivery, it depends upon the arterial oxygen content, which in turn depends upon the hemoglobin, what is the PaO2, that is P small AO2, and what is the oxygen saturation? Coming to some of the basic definition, uh, oxygen content is amount of oxygen carried by hemoglobin plus the dissolved oxygen, which is about 20 ml per every 100 cc of blood. And the mixed venous oxygen content, again, is similar to uh, the arterial content, except that we are using mixed venous blood here. The hemoglobin saturation uh, the amount of oxygen carried by the hemoglobin in the mixed venous blood and the dissolved amount of oxygen in the mixed venous blood will, as, will give us the oxygen content of the mixed venous blood and the difference is about 5 ml for every 100 cc of blood. Oxygen delivery is about 1000 ml and it can be expressed as ml per minute per meter square, which is about 500 to 600 ml. This already I mentioned, the oxygen content difference of the arterial blood vis-a-vis -vis mixed venous blood is about 5 millimeters, uh, 5 ml per every 100 cc of uh, blood. And oxygen consumption is the rate at which oxygen is removed from the blood by the tissues. What is important is when you talk about critically ill patients, this relationship between the oxygen delivery on the horizontal axis and oxygen consumption on the vertical axis, this is a, there is a critical point at which when the delivery of oxygen falls below that critical point, shock state ensues with increasing lactates and diminishing mixed venous oxygen saturation. When you come to the perfusion pressure, within a individual, the perfusion pressure is different for different organs. This is, this we must understand 
not only there are individual differences, but within the body, each of the organs needs a perfusion pressure, which is peculiar to its needs. For example, if you take the heart, we need the diastolic blood pressure, whereas in all the other organs, the mean arterial pressure. And in the brain, we have to know what is the intracranial pressure. For the kidney and bowel, we need to know what is the intra-abdominal pressure. So there is difference of how the blood is perfused in a given individual when you come to the each of the organs. This relationship shows the um, um, the, the shows the relationship between the organ perfusion pressure and the organ blood flow, and the blue line represents the autoregulatory curve. And you can see that within when the autoregulation is operational, that is between 50 to 150 millimeters of mercury mean arterial pressure, the vessels either dilate or constrict and keep the blood flow constant irrespective of the blood pr pressure level when it is between 50 to 150 mean arterial blood pressure. This is the classic depiction of the cerebral autoregulation. We have the lower limit of autoregulation and upper limit of autoregulation beyond which uh, the blood flow becomes passively dependent upon the blood pressure. This uh, curve has been determined in human volunteers. And what is important is that when we give anesthesia to patients who are diabetic, hypertensive, have cerebrovascular disease, atherosclerotic disease, on the top of that, if you are administering sevoflurane, sodium nitroprusside, nitroglycerin, the autoregulatory curve will be altered. Suppose you have given nitroglycerin infusion and you cannot expect the autoregulation to work when you are giving a vasodilator. So these things have not been highlighted in the literature and this, how, the way we manage patients influences the organ perfusion. For example, the autoregulation pressure, uh, sorry, autoregulation limits in a given patient may be narrow. For example, a hypertensive individual, this autoregulation is uh, shifted upwards and to the right. And how to determine it uh, clinically? There is no parameter by which you can go except uh, the, to some extent, we can use the cerebral oximeter to determine the autoregulation. For example, you can equate the cerebral blood flow to the cerebral perfusion, which can be detected by the, uh, the, by the uh, cerebral oximeter, which is what is shown in this diagram. This is the oxygen saturation of the brain using NIRS, that is non uh, near infrared spectroscopy and the cerebral perfusion pressure and this relationship is can be depicted or defined as um, cerebral um, cerebral oxygenation index, which is represented as zero or one. As long as this index is zero, it means that the oxygen supply to the brain is all right because of the autoregulation is maintained. Let us take the example of two patients. In this patient, we have the mean arterial pressure represented here, and the cerebral oximetric uh, saturation is measured here, represented here. So in this patient, as the blood pressure, which is mentioned here, falls to 70, 50, and even 40, the cerebral oxygen saturation is maintained, which means that this patient's uh, autoregulation is preserved uh, within a, a wide range of blood pressure limits. Whereas if you take this patient, as soon as the blood pressure, mean arterial pressure came down less than 70, there is a decrease in the regional oxygen saturation. So this patient must be managed within this range of mean arterial blood pressure. So the two, candidates, though going on identical surgery, have different requirements in terms of mean arterial pressure. And uh, I, I think I'll skip this for want of time. 
these are some of the evidences which show the that the goal directed therapy works but now we know that uh, goal directed therapy especially in critical care units uh, the, there is no difference between early goal directed therapy and usual uh, care um, sta usual stand of care this was already mentioned by satyan so i'll not repeat this and uh, if you look at this recent guidelines for the management of heart failure uh, with reduced ejection fraction, if, if you may please notice, notice that in African Americans, the guidelines are different. You can use hydra, uh, hydralazine and nitrates in those patients, but not if you are not an African uh, American, which means that there are racial differences. Similarly, if you use the standard blood pressure management visa vis personalized blood pressure management in high risk patients undergoing major surgery, patients who had standard treatment visa vis individualized treatment based on the based on their resting blood pressure, the outcomes were much better. The, this is the rate of organ dysfunction. Uh, compared to the individualized treatment, we serve a standard treatment. So the organ dysfunction was much less in the patients who had individualized treatment. We also have proposed that in the approach to non-cardiac surgery in cardiac patients, this was published uh, in the Journal of Cardiothoracic and Vascular Anesthesia two years ago. We have suggested that Indians are, uh, Asians and Indians are more vulnerable to cardiac disease. And cardiovascular disease is very rampant in these parts of the world. And uh, that's why we suggested that uh, ECG, chest X-ray echocardiography must be included in the algorithm. And one size does not, does not fit all. For example, there are several people sitting here, maybe 1,000 people sitting here, and each one is different. As is shown here, there's no similarity between the height or weight, and everybody is different. And when you look at the clinical trials, we get the mean values. This hides the individual differences. Please note this. The most powerful form of trial, the randomized controlled clinical trials, was devised as a means of determining treatment's effect um, in a particular group of patients. But there are individual differences. You are only looking at the mean values and average values. So you will not come to what is happening to the individual patients. For example, in a village of 2,000 people, all people, uh, all the individuals there submitted their photographs. And these photographs were merged using software and you got an average individual here. This person is the average individual which was determined or obtained by merging all the photographs. And this photograph has no resemblance to any of these photographs. Please note this, which means that what we say as average may not be applicable to any other individual in the community. And uh, I don't know if you can see the audio there. We have developed a policy no risk score for determination of vulnerability of a patient person and high blood pressure to coronary artery disease. diseases such as coronary artery disease or CAD. The risk of CAD and heart attack among South Asians is three, four times higher compared to Caucasians. Young onset CAD or CAD affecting people younger than 45 years of age is getting more common these days. Current approaches used to diagnose heart disease can detect the problem only after the symptoms have appeared. What if we could identify people with higher risk of heart disease much before the symptoms appear? 
Scientists have realized that our risk of diseases such as CAD are not influenced by one or two genes, but multiple genes working in tandem. An individual's predisposition to disease is impacted by millions of inherited genetic variations found scattered in their DNA called single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. On its own, each SNP contributes just a small risk, but when added together, they can make a big difference to the overall risk of disease. Polygenic Risk Score, or PRS, integrates these variations into a single metric. This metric shows if you are at high, moderate, or average risk of CAD. Using PRS, clinicians can then recommend exercise, diet, and medication to prevent the onset of the disease much before the symptoms appear. Scientists at India's leading genetic testing lab, Med Genome, have validated the PRS concept on the Indian and South Asian population and have come up with a simple blood test called Cardiogen. The Cardiogen test is based on a study done by researchers from Med Genome and other leading institutes across the country. I just wanted to put this across because there are genetic polymorphisms which are existing which will dictate how a patient or person reacts to a given stress. So these, uh, this can be tested in the laboratory and we can predict what is going to happen to a patient when subjected to a given stress. And uh, to end my talk, uh, the, we should understand that one size does not fit all. Protocolized and personalized hemodynamic management as is an example for precision in hemodynamic monitoring. Five T's of perioperative goal directed hemodynamic therapy, as uh, elucidated by Dr. Satyan Parida, must be taken into account. Artificial intelligence and big data will help us to personalize treatment strategies and improve outcomes. Precision in hemodynamic monitoring is an essential part of perioperative personalized hemodynamic management of patients. If you look at what one size fits all, I think the classic example is the sari, which is worn by Indian women. But even here, see that there are individual differences. The way it is worn is different by different individuals. Please note that there are individual differences. And making a generalization may not be correct thing to do in a given set of population. With this, I would like to thank you. And uh, uh, we are opening the session for question answers. And I'm just unsharing my screen so that I request all the panelists and speakers to switch on their videos so that we can uh, speak to them and see, see, uh, see them and speak to them and address the chat box questions. So now the floor is open to Dr. Nivedita Pani and other panelists to carry out the question and answer sessions. And also uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes or so, I will, we will address those questions which were posed at the beginning of my talk. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mulida. Thank you. Thank you so question, uh, one question is there. How to adjust a AV delay in sequential pacing in post cardiac surgical patient? Is it always regarding MAP? I think the how to adjust the AV delay? How to adjust the AV delay in sequential pacing? Very nice in... question. Anybody, anybody would like to take the question? I, I have a reasonable good answer for that. How to adjust the AV sequential uh, AV delay is usually kept at 120 milliseconds because that is the time taken for the uh, AV nodal conduction. If we keep it at 120 milliseconds, but also you can look at the LVOT VTI or ejection frag, especially LVOT VTI, and where, wherever you are getting the maximum LVOT VTI, that should be the optimal um, time interval for that particular patient. So you can start with 100 and go on increasing it up to 140, 150 
and the place where you get the maximum LVOT VTI may be the suitable uh, AV delay for that particular patient. Usually by rule of thumb, we keep that 120 milliseconds because usually we maintain heart rate of 80 to 90 beats per minute. Uh, thank you, sir. Another question is that, is there a relationship between the type of surgery and the perioperative hypotension associated with uh, organ damage? I think Satyan. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, Satyan. I did. I did put an answer to that, but uh, I would uh, uh, welcome sir's comments on this. Uh, I think there is a relationship between type of surgery, hypotension, perioperative outcomes. Hence, it is vital to when your patient is undergoing non-cardiac surgery, the simplest thing to do is to go through the revised cardiac index. If the patient has ischemic heart disease. If the patient is having cerebrovascular accident or a patient has a history of congestive heart failure, diabetes on insulin, renal dysfunction, major intracavitary surgery above the, uh, above the inguinal ligament, all these things are the risk factors which predispose the patients to hemodynamic perturbations and major adverse cardiac events, which are related to the perioperative MI. Having said that, Having said that, we, we also have what is called as myocardial injury in non-cardiac surgery, means which occurs where there is cardiac biomarker elevation without the classical features of ischemic um, myocardial infarction. There is no STT segment changes or regional wall motion abnormalities, but the cardiac biomarkers are increased. And these patients have a mortality of anywhere from 5 to 10% in 30 days time. The 30 day mortality is uh, high in these patients. So here the causative factor for this is the occurrence of intraoperative hypotension as was highlighted by Satyan Parira's talk. Satyan, you can uh, add on points on- Yeah, I think, I think uh, the same was also demonstrated by the, um, the, the study on uh, ACE inhibitors. Yes, I forgot the name of that study. Um, but where the 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 uh, incidence of um, mortality um, actually peaked on the for actually the the incidence of myocardial injury, sorry, not mortality, peaked on the first post op day. The vision study, the vision study, which actually was conducted on uh, continuance or non continuation of ACE inhibitors. Uh, which came up in anesthesiology, I think 2017 or 18, maybe. Uh, and there, uh, if you look at those graphs, the the uh, the incidence of mints actually shot up on the first post zero post operative day. Right. And I think a major uh, contributor to that outcome is wow. intraoperative hypertension. So, um, uh, but uh, what I think what Dr. Barshavraj was asking is whether. Uh, Type of surgery itself um, is an independent predictor for uh, greater organ damage when identical amounts of hypotension occurs versus less invasive surgery. I mean, the way he put it, that's what I understand. I don't have any clear, and I mean, I would, I would think that it would be so because it's not only hypotension which um, which uh, affects organ injury. There are so many other variables. Uh, the, so, if you have a multiple variables for uh, causing organ injury added onto that, a hypotensive insult would definitely cause more damage. But uh, I cannot off late, uh, I mean, offhand quote a study to uh, substantiate my point. Thank you, Satin, for that um, response. I'll just go back to the, my uh, first slide, which uh, was uh, mentioning some. I have to go back one minute. Yeah, we are there. So can we go through these uh, questions, if you don't mind? Uh, Dr. Nivedita? Yes, sir. Are you happy? Uh, see, uh, I'll uh, take up the first question. All of the following are dynamic indices of preload, except uh, uh, the one. And what? Uh, why do you think that is the correct answer? Yes, sir. The, uh, the answer is that uh, 
uh, the except is left ventric ventricular end diastolic volume uh, because what happened the stroke volume variation and the pressure variation and the systolic uh, pressure variation these all are the dynamic indicator of the preload uh, because as one example you can see uh, the pulse pressure variation is the marker of the position in the frank starling curve so yeah. as you know if there is increased preload increases the pulse pressure uh, this pulse pressure variation decreases so these all are the ppv sbp and spv they are the dynamic indicator of the preload as per the variation it occurs but not in the left ventricular end diastolic volume that's right that's right uh, i will go to dr bupesh uh, bupesh iabp inflation is triggered by which of the following events in the arterial um, pressure tracing is it anacrotic notch diacrotic notch diastolic pressure that is the least pressure in the artery wave form or the peak systolic pressure so uh, answer to this is uh, diacrotic notch uh, on yes. the artery pressure stress and this is because as you all know this iabp that is intraarotic balloon uh, pump is basically a mechanical assist devices which works on the principle of volume displacement by inflating the cuff which is placed in the descending thoracic rota proximal part of the descending thoracic rota so you need to inflate cuff during diastole which which uh, and the diacrotic notch coincides with the closure of the aortic valve yes. so when you inflate at that time it displaces blood to the uh, proximal part of the rota and increases the diastolic pressure that's why increasing the myocardial perfusion pressure while it deflates during systole that's why decreasing the after load yes. so it increases the diastolic pressure and decreases the after load while inflating in the at the time of diastolic uh, notch and deflating at the time of systole thank you thank you for that next question goes to vidya patil flow track measures all the all of the following except which parameter is not measured by flow track the uh -huh. Yes, madam. Yes, madam. Yes, sir. Uh, before answering this question, I would like to apologize. I don't know what went wrong, sir. I was knocked off for uh, nearly twenty-three minutes, uh -huh. and I when I joined back, uh, sir, you were talking. I don't know yes, what sir. went wrong. Uh, I I think uh, everybody got switched off for some time, but then uh, you all logged in. I tried my level best to do so, but then it didn't happen, sir. I'm sorry about it. no doesn't matter doesn't matter you are with us that is more important um can you, can you take up this question yes uh, yes sir. this yes, is sir. only for the benefit of the audience not to um it's only for the benefit of uh, we wanted to have audience poll but uh, that could not be arranged so we are just put it here so that the experts may give the answers for the benefit of the audience yes sir that is the whole intention Okay. The question is flow track measures all of the following except, and the answer to uh, this question is uh, the flow track measures measures all of the following except the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. Right, right, right. It doesn't measure the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. Yes, sir. Because flow track is a device attached to the peripheral arterial line, which right. is used to assess mainly the cardiac output and also the systemic arterial waveforms. Yes. and not the pulmonary artery waveform or the occlusion pressure absolutely absolutely correct and to measure the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure a pulmonary catheter artery catheter has to be passed through a central venous line absolutely uh, that is the reason sir it is a device uh, attached to the peripheral this flow track is a device which is uh, attached to the peripheral arterial line yes and it can hence measure fluctuations in the arterial pressure the heart beat to beat variation in stroke volume yes and the cardiac output which is product of heart rate into stroke volume and stroke volume yes thank you thank you for that response then we go to dr vivek dave uh, vivek dave can you please tell us uh, which one of the following equipments or tools will tell us about the extra vascular lung water is it flow track is it visual doppler ivc diameter or trans pulmonary thermodilution yeah thanks lot sir finally i got uh, got my time to uh, to speak over here uh, thank you because thank of you, the uh, because of the in between there was some technical uh, issues regarding dr uh, vidya patels so i could not able to introduce you sir 
but so uh, back to the question is here is uh, extravascular uh, lung water may be determined by one of the following uh, like four options uh, a flow track uh, b transpulmonary thermodilution uh, c esophageal doppler and uh, d ivc diameter so out of all uh, transpulmonary thermodilution is the uh, is the very sensitive uh, method to uh, determine the extravascular uh, lung water as yeah. compared to uh, all of them and uh, other variables uh, along with extravascular lung water, uh, water uh, like um, you know, global end diastolic volume, uh, PV, PV, PVPI and all these things are also uh, measured by uh, TPTD. So transpulmonary uh, thermodilution is the uh, sensitive method to uh, determine extravascular uh, lung water. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek, for that. Uh, back, back to Dr. Nivedita and other panelists. Yeah. There's one more question there. Oops, I just short of an answer to that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't think any question is there. Yeah, there was one. Biomarkers. And there was something about the role of biomarkers in organ injury prediction. Um, maybe I, I, I've given my answer in the chat box. Maybe sir could add to that. Will you please read it out for us? Um, yeah. So what, what I told them that there have been several biomarkers which have been explored with regard to target organ injury. Certainly the panel for the kidneys uh, is mind boggling. There's quite, quite a few biomarkers which have been explored, uh, but individually uh, I cannot point out any particular single biomarker which could be sensitive enough to definitely indicate organ injury. Um, it would, if you are going for biomarkers, it would be wise to choose a panel of biomarkers which could um, actually tell you whether organ injury has occurred or not. Certainly, uh, we, we have worked with NGAL, with cystitin and so, and none of them, uh, I believe, is individually sensitive enough to tell us whether kidney injury has occurred or not. So I would go for a panel uh, more than more than one biomarkers, maybe um, you know, NGAL, cystitin with the metalloproteinases, um, things like that. But, yeah. So uh, to add on to this, uh, this uh, yes, Bupesh, yes, yes. So there are different biomarkers for different kind of organ injury. But now this hypotension is also supposed to be a biomarker for sitting on the pathophysiological changes, which leads into the organ injury. So hypotension it itself is a biomarker. That concept is because hypotension itself doesn't cause Problem. It sets in you know, some pathological physiological changes which leads into the injury. So, what is your uh, take on this hypotension prediction index, uh, which has been developed by the Edwards uh, group of um, um, uh, trade company people? Anyone can answer. Maybe I, I have worked with it. With I have it. worked with it yes. for some time. They gave me a set of um, their transducers and everything to work with. They also left the HPI module with us to work with for about a month or two. I think uh, like everything else in artificial intelligence, it's promising, but uh, um, I mean, we did not uh, conduct a systematic study of the, uh, of the entire device and the um, things which they had. It looks promising, but I think there's still a long way to go before we can uh, completely uh, rely on those parameters to predict hypotension. But uh, I mean, that's what we thought about uh, arterial pressure cardiac output monitoring when they came up with it. We thought it was, uh, I mean, how can arterial trace be used to um, predict what the cardiac output would be like? And now, now it has been widely adapted. And um, so, so it holds our promise, but I think it has to be studied more and in different subsets of patients in different uh, surgical. My, my general view was that whenever the um, blood pressure actually started dipping down, um, the hypotension index, uh, uh, hypertension prediction index went up. Uh, now, if I'm looking closely at the monitor, I don't need the hypertension prediction index to tell me that the BP is now close to 65 and then in the next five minutes, it's going to go below 65. So that way, uh, but then again, I have not conducted a systematic study of the device. So uh, I'll, I'll probably, you know, uh, that, that kind of a systematic study um, would be required before uh, a final judgment could be passed on the HPI. But I think uh, Dr. Thomas Serin has done a lot of work on it. Thank you. 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 Th
he he seems to believe it's quite useful i have used in heart surgery but uh, the thing is the machine cannot predict when the surgeon is going to lift the heart so in, exactly so in cardiac surgery so, it's virtually useless it's of um, actually it it falls the i mean the hypotension prediction in, uh, crosses 85 threshold it in, goes beyond 85 when there is heart is lifted that is uh, after the event has occurred has it is telling us. so it has happened. no no even with sequential volume loss and everything it does go up it, it correlates well when the bp comes down the hypertension index prediction index it is simultaneous up. but it we need simultaneous. More, yeah we need more than that we need more than that because if we are looking at the blood pressure and seeing it dropping sequentially then i don't need an hpi index to tell me that uh, oh blood pressure is dropping 65 now in 5 minutes time it will be 60 you mentioned about prospective studies now what we should do is we should uh, use hpi index that is hypotension prediction index when you are tapering inotropes in intensive care units so the best advantage is whether we, we can uh, fairly quickly turn down the inotropes or not we should know uh by looking at the hypotension prediction index it Maybe has not been studied so no, no, much is, no that is one area i'm just one area which has not been explored not been explored so any pa panelists and moderator wants to say anything i think there are no other questions there before we wind up any last comment Vedita. I think there was something Dr. Aratan was asking: Is it only the mean arterial pressure that matters, or is it the cardiac output? Maybe circled mm -hmm. in one of his earlier questions. He was asking: Is it only the MAP, or is it the cardiac output? I didn't see the that was just related to AV sequential pacing. So, oh, okay. okay. So I already told us if we measure yes. VOT, BTI, and, and Thanks to the heart rate, it will be the cardiac output. Ultimately, it is the cardiac output which matters. Evident, because the cardiac output and the MAP might actually go in very uh, opposite directions. So we eventually have to look at the cardiac output, but then it's not always that we get the benefit of uh, directly looking at the cardiac output all the time. So. Uh, Dr. Mulli, sir, uh, can I tell something? Yes, absolutely. This uh, hemodynamic the, monitoring, as you boss. know, and all the topic today, which all the four topics are really uh, very, very good topics, and it is also a difficult topic. And all the speakers, they have uh, so nicely and so simplifiedly they have told, and uh, we must, I uh, we must give a big thanks to them for making the difficult topics to such a simpler way. Thank you very much. thank you thank you thank you uh, dr radhakrishnan is available anybody from ica fraternity if there are no none i would like to thank all the speakers and panelists for participation and uh, contributing to the scientific uh, content of this webinar um uh, particularly i would like to thank nivedita dr bhupesh dr vidya patil dr vivek dave dr vijish menopal satyan parida niranjan and uh, all the others who were participating thank you so much thank you sir. we'll meet again sometime thank you sir yeah, thanks a lot it's been a I pleasure for inviting me thank you sir thank you sir thank you vivek thank you thank you thank you thank you vidya thank you Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank Bye. Take care.